morning. If you're here today and you're just checking out Christianity or maybe you're just returning to the faith of your childhood or maybe you, you even you're not sure that there is a God or not sure about the Bible or anything. I want you to know something. I'm glad you're here. And I welcome you here, and I thank you for coming. And our prayer today is also is, is that God will reveal to you the truth about who he is and what he wants for your life. So thank you so much for coming today. And today I want to continue talking to you about the sounds of the season. All right, would you say that with me? The sounds of the season. Originally, when um, the Lord gave me this uh, title, I felt like I was going to just take some of the most common Christmas carols uh, of our day and that we sing all the time and teach from them and apply them to our lives. But as I was praying, as I shared with you last week, uh, the Holy Spirit kept telling me over and over again in my quiet times, he kept telling me, it's time to tell the church the prophetic sounds of this season. And so I want to continue along those lines today and specifically as we continue as a church uh, to live in the, the last days. How many of you know that we are living in the last days and the end, the end times and Jesus' return is coming very soon? I want to give you an encouragement today. An encourage, a word of encouragement from the Lord today. And it's this, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. Don't throw in the towel. In your, and don't stop your well-doing because God is with you. God is with you and your due season is on the way. That's what I heard the Lord say to tell each of you this morning is your due season, the season that you're going to reap a blessing, the season that you're going to see God's favor move in a powerful way, your due season is on the way. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. I ask you, Lord, to speak through me. Your word to, to your people today. I ask you, Lord, to open our hearts to understand what you're saying to us. Open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church today. In Jesus' name we ask. Everybody said amen. Amen. Human beings, uh, I was thinking about this this week. Human beings actually have a remarkable and, and sad capacity for getting tired of wonderful things. We can get tired of the good things. Think, think about this. Almost all of us can think about something that you used to be really enthusiastic about. You used to be really on fire and passionate about something, but now the joy may have faded. It's like going on vacation, and you see that sunset for the, that first night, and it's just like, okay, it was beautiful, it was breathtaking, it made us so happy, and oh, we had all the warm, fuzzy feelings of a, of a vacation, and it was just, and then by the end of your stay, you hardly notice the sunset anymore. Vacationers can get tired of sunsets, millionaires can get tired of money, it's true, kids can get tired of toys. And Christians can get tired of doing good. Christians can get tired of well-doing. At first, let me just explain it. At first, we're so excited. We feel so clean and so strong in the Holy Spirit when, when we get saved and we join that church and we, and we teach those kids or we serve as an usher or a greeter. And we're so excited to, to lead that small group or participate in a Bible study or visit newcomers or pray for the sick or, or just be excited about reading the Bible and learning how to pray. We were, we're so excited just to help out a little bit around the church or to be involved in an outreach mission of some kind. But for, no, for whatever reason, as time goes on, we can sometimes grow weary and we can become discouraged. Everybody say discouraged. We can become discouraged in our well-doing. And that joy of the Lord and that excitement to be a part of his plan can slowly fade away. It can slowly slip out and it becomes a chore. And it becomes something that's hard and difficult and you're just doing it because you feel obligated to do it. 
But the word of the Lord comes to us through the Apostle Paul in Galatians. I want you to see this. If you have, this, if you have your notes, go ahead and pull them out. It's going to be up on your screen as well. But the Apostle Paul speaks directly to followers of Jesus Christ who, who, who have well-meaning intentions. They are doing the right thing, but perhaps they are losing their enthusiasm. Perhaps they are losing their passion for what they once loved to do. And the Apostle Paul speaks something profound in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, as he says this. And let us not grow weary while doing good. Amen? For in due season, there's the word of the Lord for you today. In due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I love the way the Amplified Version says it. It brings it out a little bit more clearer for us. It says this, And let us do not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing what is right. Listen. For in due time. Everybody say due time. The due time is now. It's on the way. And uh, at the appointed season. Everybody say appointed season. We shall reap. We shall reap if. Everybody say if. If. This is a promise that is conditional. It It depends on you. It depends on your decision. If we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. And we have to ask ourselves, what is this well doing that the Apostle Paul is talking to us about? And probably the best answer is to look a little bit uh, earlier in the book of Galatians and find out that Paul is talking about you're doing well as far as walking in the Spirit and living out the fruit of the Spirit. You remember the old Fruit of the Spirit song? Somebody sing it who's who's in... uh, uh, Kid Spring. I know Kid Spring sings it all the time. What is it? What is it, Tracy? You want to sing it? Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to embarrass you that way. But in other words, don't grow weary of being loving and being patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled. How many of you know we can grow weary living out this Christian life? We can grow weary putting our, putting our flesh under. We can grow weary saying no to ourselves and denying ourselves and taking up our cross. We can grow weary doing the right thing. When somebody makes you mad, you just want to punch them in the face. Sometimes... You can't do that if you're walking in the Spirit and you're walking out the fruit of the Spirit, right? You cannot do that. And and you have to walk in love and you have to walk in patience and you have to be kind to people. But sometimes you can grow weary in your walk with God. Can anybody relate to that? Okay. (laughs) In other words, we, we don't need to get tired of sharing acts of love to our friends, our family, our our associates, our neighbors. Let me just say it this way. We don't need to get tired and discouraged in our loving obedience to the Lord. Instead, we need to get fired back up. We need to live enthusiastically and live passionately in these last days. Why? Because God has promised that our due season, our appointed time, The harvest of blessing is coming to us in in this life, yes, but also in the life to come if, if, if we do not lose heart and give up and grow weary and throw in the towel. You see, there's a prophetic assignment upon the church in these last days, and you and I are, are a part of that prophetic assignment. And it's an assignment, as Ashley talked about earlier, to help people everywhere to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and to make a difference. It's, it's, it's an assignment to proclaim the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And when we think about the word gospel and that it means good news, our minds should go immediately to the person and work of Jesus Christ. When we think about the gospel, we think about his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, as well as his present intercession for us at the right hand of the Father right now. And not only that, we should think about his kingly rule that's going on in heaven, right on the throne of heaven. We think about his glorious return. And we think about his eternal consummation with the new creation that is coming one day. All of these things are his gospel. And they are good news to us. And we have an assignment to proclaim that good news as a church. As we are living in, that, in, the, in these last days. It's also an assignment. Just follow this with me. Uh, it's also an assignment to help people understand that they are set free in Christ. They can, you can be totally free in Christ. The word of God tells us in uh, John 8. Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth. And guess what? That truth that you know will set you free. He goes on to say, so if the Son sets you free, what? You are free indeed. So we have an assignment to proclaim the gospel. We have an assignment as a church to let people know they can be set free by Jesus. And we have an assignment to equip people to discover their God-given purpose and to live that out in their lives. I love the way Paul says it in Ephesians. Uh, Chapter 2, he says, for we are God's handiwork. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Everybody say, do good works, which God prepared in advance that we should do. It's also an assignment to ultimately impact our world for the kingdom. Matthew said, I mean, uh, Jesus said, In Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a a witness to me. And then the end will come. Our unique and prophetic assignment as a church in these last days can be summed up with these words. And this is what I've been feeling in my prayer time. That with great love and compassion and anticipation... For for the second coming of Jesus Christ, we can proclaim from the rooftops, people of Las Vegas, people of Nevada, people of the United States of America, people of the world, listen up because it's time to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And he's saying this, prepare the way of the Lord and make his way straight. It's Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. That was the same calling that John the Baptist had for, to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus to come the first time. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. I love the way that the Passion Translation says that same verse. It says this, prepare yourself for the Lord's coming and level a straight path inside your hearts for him. Prepare yourself because he's coming. And similar, as I said, similar to John the Baptist when Jesus came the first time, our assignment as a church and through the power of the Holy Spirit is to be Jesus' witnesses, to proclaim his beauty, to proclaim his soon coming, to proclaim his glorious gospel, all the while staying very enthusiastic about doing good, all the while refusing to get discouraged, all the while refusing to give up and throw in the towel. Now, if the devil could do anything, he he wants to get us discouraged. He wants to get us tired and weary of well-doing in these days. I heard a story that one day the devil was auctioning off his tools, 
This is not a true story or biblical story, so uh, save your emails. But I heard, the, I heard the story that one day the devil was auctioning off his tools, and, and they, were, they were highly prized tools that he used, like laziness and pride and hate and envy and jealousy. But one tool that the devil had, it, it was not for sale. It was absolutely not for sale. And one person asked the devil, why is that tool not for sale? And Satan whispered, I can't afford to get rid of that one. It's my chief tool. It's the tool of discouragement. He said, I can pry any heart with that tool. And once I'm inside, I can do anything I want. Write that down if you're taking notes with me. The chief tool of the enemy, our adversary, the accuser of the brethren, the one who speaks only lies, the father of lies. Nothing that comes out of his mouth is true. The chief tool of the enemy is discouragement to get you to give up, to get you to quiet down. To get you to throw in the towel and say, this isn't worth it anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. If he can get into your heart and get you discouraged, he can just about do anything he wants to with you. The chief tool of Satan is discouragement. And that in our midst of doing well, doing, well, doing good works, <clears throat> our, adver- our adversary, the enemy, will try his best to bring huge amounts of discouragement in our lives. And I've found just in my personal experience that he'll do that in four different ways. Jot these down if you're taking notes with me. Number one way is fatigue. Man, the enemy would love to just get you so physically and emotionally exhausted. And when you're there, you're, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable to an attack of discouragement when you're tired. Your defenses are lowered and and things can seem a little bleaker than they actually are. Sometimes the best thing to do about fatigue is to learn how to rest. Learn how to say no. Learn how to say yes to the important things. Learn how to take naps. Hello. Anybody like naps? Okay. Learn how to go to bed at a decent hour and get some sleep. You know, I'm just talking very practically to you because sometimes when you're tired, you make the worst decisions. Don't make big decisions when you're filled with fatigue because that's, that's a great opportunity for the enemy to work through discouragement in your life. Number two way is this frustration. Frustration. When Satan sends people or circumstances to try to derail you, and when trivial matters come up, and and when the unexpected interruptions come into your life, they try to prevent you from doing the things that you're called to do. And your frustration can easily lead to discouragement. Number three is this, failure. Sometimes the best laid plans just fall apart. The projects collapse, the deal falls through, no one shows up to the event, and how do you react? Do you allow the devil to come in during that time? Do you give in to self-pity and throw yourself a nice pity party? Okay, how many of you like to throw pity parties? Okay, I do too. I throw them, I throw them too, too many times. But and we, we, we blame others, and the enemy will just tell us during these times, give up. It's not worth it. Throw in the towel. It's not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be good. You, you're not gonna be able to make it. Number four causes this of discouragement is this is fear. Fear. Fear is is behind more discouragement than we like to admit. The fear of criticism. Anybody ever ever experienced the fear of criticism? What will people think? Right? What will people think? The fear of responsibility. What if I can't handle this? The fear of failure. What if I just completely screw everything up and blow it? Right? Fear can be a major onset of discouragement. And And every single Christian, including myself, will encounter this the devil's tool of discouragement, especially 
when we begin moving forward in our prophetic assignment, especially when we begin to understand why we're here as a church and who we are. When we begin to move forward in those times, the enemy will work overtime to try to get us discouraged. The Lord spoke this to me this week, and um, I want to share it with you. It says this, when, when your assignment, this is up on the screen, when your assignment is awakened within you, your adversary is awakened against you. <clears throat> when you really get a grasp of what God has called you to do in these last days, the enemy is not going to sit on the sidelines silent. He's going to do everything to can, he can to get you in that dark place of discouragement. But we can learn, listen to me, we can learn to resist the devil, to stay strong in our faith, to submit to God and live victoriously, trusting in God's resources and delivering power in our lives. When I think about discouragement. I, I think uh, you're, if you're in a place of discouragement today, you're not alone. Boy, the Bible is filled with lots of people who are experiencing seasons of discouragement. Moses experienced discouragement as he grieved over the sins of his people. David, the Old Testament king, experienced discouragement and battled deep depression and despair. Jonah was angry and discouraged and wanted to run away and give up his assignment. Job experienced discouragement and suffered through great loss devastation and physical illness. Elijah, the prophet in the Old Testament, faced huge discouragement after a great time of victory. Jeremiah wrestled with discouragement through great loneliness and feelings of defeat and insecurity. John the Baptist faced a huge discouragement as he was thrown into prison, all on the road to fulfilling his prophetic assignment. But what is true about all these people and what's true about you and what's true about me is that even in our discouragement, God is with you. God is with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And he was there in the good days. He's, He's there in the dark days too. And he didn't condemn them for their questions or their pain. He didn't tell them just to tough it out. He reached down to their deepest pit of suffering and he lifted them out by his his compassionate hand. He cared for them. He showed them compassion. He offered mercy. He brought them hope. He instilled purpose. He gave them victory and beloved God still works in the same way today. He still does that for each one of us. We have a savior Jesus Christ, who never leaves us or forsakes us. He understands our discouragement and our pain. He knows about every weakness and hurt, and he reaches out to us, offering compassion and hope. He is our healer. He is our redeemer. He is our restorer, and he is our friend, and he will never waste a season of discouragement that we face, but instead he will use it in some way to bring hope, to instill purpose, to help somebody else, and to make us stronger. And so what do I hear about the sounds of the Spirit today in this season? It's the same thing that that Moses said to the Israelites when they were moving toward their promised land. It's in Deuteronomy 1.21. It says, See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord your God has. Uh, of your ancestors told you, look at these words, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. I hear the Holy Spirit in this season saying that to, to us, specifically as a church, saying the same thing that the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 when he said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? Because the Lord your God will be with you. Everybody say, with me, wherever you go. If God has called you to it, he will be with you along the way. Courage doesn't mean that we don't feel fear. Courage means that we do it afraid. 
It means that I don't allow fear to call the shots. It means that I trust God to be with me and to never leave me. And I trust him to make a way where there seems to be no way. And I hear the Lord saying to his church this morning, forward march. Forward march. Let me give you a few practical examples uh, and thoughts to help us to overcome discouragement in our lives, okay? Number one thing is this. We must give up the right to understand everything. <clears throat> Things happen in our lives that we do, we do not fully understand, and you can get stuck in asking why. Why, 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 why? You can dry up and die right there in that place. Instead of asking why, why don't you start asking what? What do you want to teach me in this, Lord? What am I to learn in this? What's your purpose in this? And the Lord will help you to overcome that discouragement because we need to make sure that our faith comes before our understanding. Our faith must come before our understanding. Look at what it says in Isaiah 55, 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Number two is this. We must measure success by obedience, not outward success. Now, this is really important for us. It's really important for church people, church leaders, emerging leaders who are looking to be a success for the Lord. Listen, we've got to measure our success by obedience, not by the numbers, not by the crowds, not by the money, not by any of those outward circum circumstances kinds of things. But we measure our success by what is important to the Lord. And it's important to the Lord that we live in Obedience. Everybody say obedience. <clears throat> First uh, Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying him? Obeying the Lord. To obey, look at this, is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. In other words, what's the most important thing to the Lord? It's a heart of loving obedience to him, a heart of loving obedience to him, and that's how we measure success. The next thing is this, I, we must pray daily God's word over our lives. We can never forget the power of the word of God in our everyday lives. Yeah, we hear it for a little while on Sunday mornings, but what about Monday? And what about the rest of the week? Are you spending time praying God's word over your life? Haven't you noticed that sometimes this is what I've experienced in my own life when I'm going through a season of discouragement. I notice how different I feel and how different my perspective is when God speaks to me through his word. It's as if a light goes on to dispel the darkness that's trying to overtake me. And when we read and when we pray his word and have that living interactive dialogue with the Lord Most High, it changes our lives and it lifts us out of those discouraging seasons. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. <clears throat> Next, I would tell you is that we've got to choose faithfulness. We need to choose faithfulness. God is faithful way more than we can ever be faithful, but he values faithfulness. He values faithful hearts. And when we live out our lives, we should be living in such a way that we are looking for his well done, my good and faithful servant. His, we want to hear his voice say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Servant, You were faithful over a few things, and now, here, I'm going to give you a lot. Jesus said this uh, to this same idea in Matthew 25 when he was ministering. He said, his master replied in this story that Jesus was teaching, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. You've been faithful with a few things, but now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's Happiness. Don't forget about faithfulness. 
Don't forget about faithfulness. The next thing is this. We must learn the habit of giving thanks. An attitude of gratitude, right? It's hard to be discouraged when, you're, when you have a thankful heart. And when you remember what God has done for you in the past, you remember your history with him, and you encourage yourself in the Lord because you know that he is always faithful and that he is always good. Discouragement is a loss of perspective. You have to remember that he will complete that good work that he began in you. 1 Thessalonians 5 says it this way, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances, that's the good, the bad, and everything in between, because this attitude, this thankfulness is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And here's the final thing I would say, practically speaking, as we, as we need to Uh, resist discouragement in our lives and continue doing well is that we must resist discouragement in the name of Jesus. We have to resist it in Jesus' name, in prayer, in worship, in praise. When you're in a spiritual battle, there is a spirit of discouragement that we must resist in Jesus' name. Darkness is covering the earth, but there is Power in the name of Jesus. Just like we sung about earlier, there is great power in his name. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter said this to the church, be alert and of sober mind. Because why? Your enemy, the devil, your adversary, the one who's trying to kill, steal, and destroy and lie to you. Your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to eat up, to devour. And he says this, resist him. Resist him and stand firm in your faith. Resist that spirit of discouragement in the name of Jesus. And the Lord will fight that battle for you as you submit to him. So remember... You may be here today and you may be going through this season of discouragement that we've been talking about for whatever reason. Maybe somebody has hurt you. Maybe somebody said something about you. Maybe your circumstances are just confusing and chaotic and you don't know exactly what to do. And the devil is trying to get you down. And he's trying to slow you down. And he's trying to get you to throw in the towel so that you won't fulfill your prophetic destiny in God. But you have to remember today that God is with you. You are loved. You are valued. You have a wonderful God who who is good and he has an amazing plan for your life. And in these last days, we have to remember this. As a church, we have to stand up with boldness and against the lies of the enemy and speak the true word of the Lord. And we have to resist the devil's tool of discouragement. Because he will not win because we are not alone. The Lord is with us and he fights with us. And let me share this uh, scripture again. This is the same scripture that I shared with you at the top of the message. It's Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. I want you to hear this. I want it to be like a Holy Spirit missile going right into your heart today. It says this, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let me encourage you, church. What I'm hearing in the spirit is that your due season, this church's due season, your family's due season is right around the corner. It's right around the corner. Let's be faithful. Let's be thankful. Let's proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's go, let's move forward in the name of Jesus boldly and confidently as the church of the living God living in these last days. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, and invite our instrumentalists to come up?